Welcome to this video where we will be looking at the pathophysiology of pneumonia. Pneumonia refers to infection of the lung tissue, as opposed to the large and small airways, and this is caused by foreign pathogens leading to inflammation. Before we look at the pathophysiology of pneumonia, let's go over some basic anatomy and physiology. Alveoli are the functional aspects of lung tissue that are responsible for the gaseous exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. There are several defence mechanisms that protect the alveoli from pathogens to ensure that they remain sterile. The trachea and bronchi contain pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells. These cells have cilia on their apical surface, which are small, hair-like projections that help to move mucus and pathogens away from the lower respiratory tract up towards the mouth, where they can be coughed up or swallowed. Amongst these cells, there are goblet cells, and goblet cells are responsible for secreting the mucus that lines the respiratory tract. With the cilia, this makes the mucociliary escalator. Presented on the surface membrane of cells, there are immunoglobulin A antibodies, which make up part of the adaptive immune system. Immunoglobulin A antibodies work by binding pathogens and neutralising them to prevent them from causing an infection. Within the alveoli, there are fixed macrophages, known as alveolar macrophages and they provide a way of eliminating pathogens and debris through a process known as phagocytosis, which is the engulfment and destruction of the pathogen. These macrophages are also capable of excreting cytokines. These cytokines signal other immune cells to the area to help fight the infective agent, and this process is known as chemotaxis. When irritants stimulate the cells within the respiratory tract, it initiates the cough reflex, which provides forceful expulsion of air and pathogens. Despite the combined defence mechanisms of the mucociliary escalator, immunoglobulin A antibodies and the alveolar macrophages, pathogens are still sometimes able to invade and infect the respiratory system. Now that we have an understanding of normal physiology in terms of normal respiratory defence mechanisms, let's look at the pathophysiology of pneumonia. It is important to understand that many different types of pathogens can cause infection, and each pathogen will have its own mechanism of action when it comes to causing an inflammatory response. Approximately 75% of pneumonia cases are caused by bacteria. 20% of cases are viral and approximately 5% are atypical, such as fungal. Often, viral pneumonia can lead to bacterial pneumonia as the virus damages pulmonary cells and defence mechanisms, allowing the bacteria to more easily invade and colonise. Pathogens can enter the alveoli by different routes. These routes include inhalation, aspiration, and through the hematogenous route, although this is rare and mainly seen in those who use intravenous drugs. Let's start by looking at how bacteria cause pneumonia and an inflammatory response. Once bacteria have entered the alveoli, they release endotoxins and exotoxins, which are harmful substances that alter the function of alveolar cells and can disrupt normal physiology. These damaged cells will start to release leukotrienes, such as leukotriene B4, C4, D4 and E4. It is not important to remember the names of these leukotrienes, but it's worthwhile knowing their effects. 
These chemical mediators of inflammation cause bronchospasm, increased mucus production, and an increase in local vascular permeability to allow other immune cells to enter the area, which ordinarily are too big to pass through the cell gap junctions. Leukotrienes also act as chemotactic agents, and as we discussed, this is the process where other immune cells are signaled to the area. Other immune cells include complement proteins and white blood cells, which will help fight the infection. As tissue damage occurs, localised mast cells within the respiratory system will undergo degranulation. And degranulation is the release of histamine that causes further vascular permeability and bronchospasm. Alveolar macrophages will attempt to phagocytose the bacteria and in the process will release cytokines such as tumor necrotic factor alpha and interleukin-1 which will further enhance the inflammatory cascade and are responsible for inducing pyrexia. This is done by acting on the hypothalamus and increasing the set point of normal body temperature. This serves as a useful purpose as the immune system works more effectively at higher temperatures and provides an inhospitable environment for the pathogen, which is why it's not always in the patient's best interest to try and control temperature. Viruses cause the same inflammatory process but their mechanism of action is slightly different. A virus is not a living organism, so it must invade a living cell in order to replicate and survive. A virus will enter a cell and then will replicate its own proteins using the functional aspects of the living cell it has invaded. In doing so, the cell can no longer produce its own proteins necessary for survival eventually leading to cell death. The injury and death of cells starts the inflammatory process as leukotrienes are released from the cell and alveolar macrophages phagocytose cellular debris and further enhance the inflammatory cascade. The progression of pneumonia is broken down into stages based on the physiological changes occurring within the infected lung tissue. The first stage occurs within the first 48 hours of infection and we refer to this as congestion. This is the result of the acute inflammatory response where chemical mediators are released causing vasodilation, increased capillary permeability and the diffusion of plasma proteins into the area, congesting the lung tissue. The second stage occurs around days 3 to 4 and is known as red hepatization or consolidation. This is when the area becomes consolidated with red blood cells, white blood cells and fibrin. Around days 4 to 6 the third stage occurs and this is known as grey hepatization. This is when the red blood cells are slowly destroyed and take on a grey appearance. The final stage is resolution. This is the breakdown of all proteins and damaged cells as the causative agent has been destroyed and the immune cells are no longer required. It is important to remember though that these stages will vary depending on the severity of infection and underlying comorbidities that these patients may have. Pneumonia can either affect an entire lobe known as lobar pneumonia, or can be diffuse, known as bronchopneumonia, but this does not mean that the bronchi and bronchioles are infected. Lobar pneumonia will start distally and move more proximally as the disease progresses, whereas bronchopneumonia will start proximally and work its way distally. Now let's look at some of the causes of pneumonia. As we discussed, pneumonia can be caused by bacterial, 
viral, or atypical microbes. The most common bacteria that cause pneumonia are Streptococcus pneumoniae, which accounts for approximately 50% of bacterial cases, Haemophilus influenza, which accounts for approximately 20% of bacterial cases, Staphylococcus aureus, which is particularly dangerous if it has developed a resistance to methicillin, otherwise known as MRSA. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is more prevalent in those with underlying disease such as cystic fibrosis. And finally, Moraxella catarralis, which is more prevalent in patients who are immunocompromised or who have underlying lung disease, such as COPD. The most common viral causes include the parainfluenza virus, the respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, the cytomegalovirus and the varicella zoster virus. Atypical pneumonia can be caused by Mycoplasma pneumoniae. Now, this is a bacteria and is most commonly seen in young adults and causes a mild pneumonia, also called a walking pneumonia. These patients will have mild symptoms of pneumonia but may present with neurological features. Legionella, which is a gram-negative bacteria and is found in contaminated water which may be spread through things such as air conditioning units. And finally, Klebsiella pneumoniae. This is a bacteria and it's present within the GI system and is most commonly seen in aspiration pneumonia. Those at greatest risk of Klebsiella pneumoniae are those who are alcohol dependent. Although it is not necessary to remember all the causes of pneumonia, it's important to have an understanding as this will help guide management and treatment. Pneumonia can also be categorized by the setting in which the patient has contracted the infection. Community acquired pneumonia is where the patient has contracted pneumonia outside of a healthcare facility and is the most common. The other category is hospital acquired pneumonia which is where the patient has contracted the illness in a healthcare environment, usually when they are already being treated for another illness. This is less common but can be more severe. This is because the patients are already unwell and the pathogens in hospital can be resistant to antibiotics. A subcategory of hospital acquired pneumonia is ventilator acquired pneumonia and as the name suggests this is where a patient who is on a ventilator contracts pneumonia. Patients on a ventilator are intubated and this tube bypasses the mucociliary escalator and the immunoglobulin A antibodies and because these patients are intubated they're also sedated. This means they lose their cough reflex, which normally provides forceful expulsion of foreign particles. There are several modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors that increase a person's chance of developing pneumonia. These include old age, smoking, as nicotine inhibits ciliary movement within the mucociliary escalator, therefore inhibiting this defense mechanism. Smoking also leads to excess mucus production for pathogens to survive and introduces multiple toxins into the pulmonary system that can inhibit normal immunological responses. Underlying lung disease, such as COPD, will provide a more hospitable environment for bacteria with several defence mechanisms destroyed, such as the mucociliary escalator. Immunocompromised patients, such as those with an immunoglobulin A antibody deficiency, 
will not have the normal defence mechanisms to help protect them against foreign pathogens. And finally, alcohol consumption. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant that can depress the cough reflex, as well as promote aspiration, and alcohol also damages alveolar macrophages. To recap, Despite pulmonary defence mechanisms, bacteria, viruses and fungi can infect the lung tissue, leading to inflammation and consolidation. This inflammatory response, as well as impaired gaseous exchange, leads to the signs and symptoms associated with pneumonia. Pneumonia can be categorised based on the setting in which it has developed, with hospital-acquired pneumonia being the most dangerous. There are several modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors that alter an individual's chance of developing pneumonia. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other video on the signs, symptoms, investigations and management of pneumonia and if there are any topics you would like us to cover then please leave a comment in the comment section below.